would start by saying, without saying, uh, that Carrie has been, for me, not only a mentor, but a dear friend in uh, recent years, a dear friend of the faculty. So very happy about having you uh, back here and about hearing you um, today. Um, Carrie's main field, I would say, is uh, alternative dispute resolution and more uh, generally uh, procedure or process pluralism, a term she coined. Um, and uh, legal problem solving. And in this field, uh, she um, is not only a founder, as uh, she, I think, uh, um, states uh, modestly in her uh, resume, but probably the founder. Um, in one of her articles, she wrote about the mothers and fathers of the field. So for me, Carrie is a mother of the field. Um, and she um, has. Um, uh, uh, been a, a faculty member uh, of uh, UCLA, Georgetown, now uh, at UCI Davis, uh, at the UCI Irvine, sorry, um, as well, and has uh, written over 150 articles, leading books in the field, and in her research has uh, uh, not only uh, focused on dispute resolution, but is also focused on legal education, which is our topic today and legal ethics and uh, uh, legal feminism and legal theory more um, generally. And uh, um, again, I won't point out to all of the different things uh, Carrie has done in a rich uh, uh, career, but I will say just a few things I'm sure um, will come up in her talk, which have come up in the previous conversations and I think have characterized Carrie's work um, and her thinking about some of the issues we're talking today from the very early uh, years. Um, Carrie um, has always recognized that law operates beyond courts and beyond litigation, uh, offering this conception of process pluralism. Um, she has always worked with the tension between the need to be local and contextual and the need to generalize and say something that is perhaps applicable to other jurisdictions as well. Um, and she has always recognized the need of lawyers to know more than law uh, and be exposed to other disciplines in ADR as well as in other areas of practice. And perhaps unique to us proceduralists, she has always been very sensitive to the significance of tools and procedures and the need to incorporate these into different areas of law when thinking about legal education. So without further ado, um, Carrie, please come. We'd love to hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm hoping not to take up too much time because um, we're supposed to have a conversation. Um, and uh, let me just start. This is a, these slides are actually prepared because in the last two years I've been doing a lot of keynoting at uh, conferences on globalization of legal education. So some of these slides come from a conference that I went to in Australia in December where I was the keynote speaker. And you should know the Australians actually have an organization that is empirically studying legal education. So the title is Legal Education uh, Questions We're Afraid to Ask. We actually have much less research on what makes good legal education than many other places, and Australia's actually been a leader about that. So I said this morning, I just want to preface these remarks by saying, I've taught in 26 countries. So a lot of the issues that came up this morning are representative of issues that are being faced in some parts of the world and not others. So to the extent we're trying to figure out what's good for Haifa and good for Israel, I just don't, I want to take up too much time uh, with American examples because I actually have a, a rich experience from lots of other countries and it might be useful for us to talk about what works in different settings. So technology, uh, what I'm going to do very quickly in these slides is talk briefly about the history of legal education. I call them the six bangs of legal education. I have participated, as by my count, in ten different legal reform movements in legal education in the United States. Um, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. But what's going on right now, when we're having these conversations in the United States, is the uh, <coughs> University of California, Irvine, we've been talking to a lot of venture capitalists uh, in our region of the world, and our new dean is, uh, is looking at a number of different purposes, one of them being, and this would be good for HIFA too, uh, she wants us to be the AI um, center of American legal education. So we're talking to a lot of folks with a lot of money to finance artificial intelligence and the law. So question to the students. 
Um, is there a cause of action or is there an app for that? Um, and I might just mention that one way to teach this, my other institution, I'm still on the Georgetown faculty, at Georgetown, um, we every year now have a justice hackathon. Um, and the students are designing um, uh, apps for access to justice. And it's been going on for about five years. And, this, uh, and much of this, if you want to go look it up, much of what I'm going to say is available on the web in various forms or other. But students uh, compete to develop apps for access to justice, immigration law, family law, encounters with the police. This is Washington, D.C. Um, and the students are attempting to figure out how to create descriptions and information about the law for lay people. Um, and so one of the questions that's going to happen since I am, as Orna mentioned, a legal ethicist, when we form an artificial intelligence center, one of the questions is, what's the ethics of uh, access to justice when it goes online? That's Orna's field. That's the mother of ODR over there, um, who's brought me in, kicking and screaming into the modern world, because I was some you know, face-to-face -face dispute resolution person, and I am now a student of uh, Orna's and of online dispute resolution. But I've been engaged to deal with some of the ethical questions uh, in the use of uh, aggregative justice and logarithms and algorithms and people making decisions on the basis of things other than individual people's um, facts. So as I say here, I've been a witness to at least 10 different legal education reforms in my life. Um, the, the clinical education, uh, I was the founder of the Penn Clinical Program that Anita referenced earlier. Uh, I was one of the founders of Critical Legal Studies in the United States. I wish I was still a card-carrying member, but there's no organization anymore. <laughs> Legal feminism. Uh, uh, I was actually part of the first group that put the first critical race conference together at UCLA some years ago. Uh, critical race broke off of critical legal studies, but I remain um, active as an advisor and scholar in critical race and what we call generally outsider jurisprudence against relevant here. To what extent do groups that are not in the mainstream create their own theories of law? Uh, by the way, when I get to the end of this, you'll hear from me. I believe in diversity in legal education. I, I, I'm really interested in your question about whether to stay here or move down the hill. Um, and by the end of this, all you have to hear from me is both are absolutely essential, theory, practice, and engagement with the world. And I don't know where you put yourself, maybe in the middle of the hill, um, <laughs> but it's very, very important. Um, I was also at the very beginning of the socio-legal studies, empirical research movement in the United States and throughout my career. Uh, my husband, who you will meet later on, and I did a lot of empirical studies together um, on the law and I still believe in that. As I'm saying here, we need some more good empirical research on legal education, what works and what doesn't. Okay, so we do this right. Um, the big bangs, um, can you do that? I guess it's coming next. The big bangs in legal education. Number one, the, the phrase that we all know of, um, what does it mean to think like a lawyer? Langdell, the Socratic method, teaching people to learn the tropes of legal analysis, to be able to think on their feet. That's why people get called on in Socratic classes. Unfortunately, I want to say empirically, I do a lot of um, a strategic planning work uh, in law schools all over the United States. Um, and despite what anyone says, many Europeans come to study with us because they believe we have the Socratic method. We do not empirically have the Socratic method anymore. I go to hundreds of law school classes every year, um, and most of them have turned into lectures with essentially punctuated <laughs> questions. So I don't think we're um, uh, all that different from the European model of didactic lectures. And I personally don't like it, because one of the other things I mothered was experiential education. Not just clinical, but experiential role plays in the classroom. I don't teach a single class in which something isn't done in the class with the students doing some task. Um, and I'm seeing less and less of it in traditional classes. There's a lot of experiential learning and externships and clinical education, but I still see a value of it inside classes. So um, enough of that. Here are the big bags. That's the one picture. Um, so uh, critical thinking. That's what we're supposedly teaching in law school. How to be a critical thinker. Um, but as we were talking at lunch and elsewhere, an important question, and this is why critical legal studies is important, is who made the theory, who made the doctrine that we study? Mostly a bunch of dwems, um, dead white European males, Ashkenazis if you want. <laughs> um, some of them, not all of them, but our theory is very embedded um, in particular creators of jurisprudence. So what feminist uh, legal theory did to legal theory was to open that up and to ask the questions, who is creating the knowledge? 
uh, for those of you familiar with uh, all the critical legal studies literature, um, I was uh, I was there at the beginning of CLS, and if you haven't read it, you might still want to take a look at Duncan Kennedy's reproduction, legal education, and the reproduction of hierarchy. That is the left Marxist um, critique of legal education, and very dramatically, Duncan used to occasionally stand in the back of the classroom. You know, very dramatic. Duncan's a wonderful. Um, uh, stylist. Uh, so Duncan used to stand in the black back of his classroom so as to destabilize the hierarchy of the classroom. And that was, uh, I thought, a very dramatic move. Uh, on this list I have a bunch of the critiques of who has made our theories of law. So I would just say theories of law need to be studied, uh, but also the dynamism in them and, and which schools of thought have changed them, which is still true. At Georgetown, we have an experimental curriculum. There are four first-year sections. One of the sections is called Curriculum B. I was uh, uh, second generation in that one, not a founder, but I, I came along second. Oh, oh, right, Anita yeah. was cast. We do have some. So, um, so aside from the fact that the courses all had different names, so Civil Procedure, which I taught in Bill Eskridge uh, crafted originally, is called Law, Process, and Society. So it introduced ADR in this, in this Civil Procedure class. Um, the students did, did visits to courts, and they w went to offices, and they had to do a, a little empirical project in my class, uh, but also a little criminal procedure and a little administrative procedure to do comparative procedure. What I was going to mention, see I'm talking fast, we got a lot of stuff in there, was the students in that section were also part of a seminar called Justice. Um, and that was a seminar that transcended the individual first year courses and exposed each student to the different theories of American jurisprudence from legal positivism, legal realism, critical legal studies, outsider jurisprudence, law and economics, uh, critical race theory, and, uh, and ultimately Mike Seidman added to that a really interesting unit on legal pragmatism, which is sort of where I would put myself if I had to pick a school. Uh, but again, the idea was for students to understand all the different schools of thought that were affecting the doctrine that they were studying. Um, and, I, and that program is still operating. It is one of the most amazing reforms in uh, American legal education that's still continuing. And I say that because we've got a distinguished founder sitting here, Anita, um, but that program has now been able to have essentially four generations of professors because as each of us have left, somebody has replaced us. If they haven't killed the program just because all the, not all, but some of oh, Mark Tushnet too, since some of the founders have left, they're, they're deep enough in the faculty committed to these ideas that they can keep um, teaching that way. Um, so then came the doing like a lawyer, uh, Big Bang. Uh, as I said, I was part of the founding of clinical education, first at Penn, then at UCLA, then Georgetown. I do not teach clinically at Irvine. I'll get to that in a moment at all. But I do my clinical teaching from within um, traditional courses. Um, a little shout out to Mike, who says he's not teaching anymore except for occasionally as an emeritus. But the, I, for those of you looking for new things to do, I think the current new real big bang in good legal education that's going on at Stanford is the policy labs. Uh, Mike described his. I teach in two of those every year. I fly up to do a couple classes in dispute system design, um, which is a course, a seminar, in what are the practical issues around designing um, dispute systems. So the course has done things like dispute systems for family court in Northern California, some online stuff, many international projects. I think the last time I was in this room, I actually talked about my transitional justice work mm -hmm. in a lot of different countries. And the dispute system design course also focuses on crafting post-conflict transitional systems. So, and that's, that course wonderfully has a lot of LLM students from all over the world in it at Stanford. And I've also taught it in Australia. So that kind of course, when you have people in Australia from the whole Pacific Rim, and people from other countries, so it's culturally interesting. They learn uh, what we would call American ADR systems theory, but then it is applied in context, depending on, on what's going on. Um, Harvard Law School, for those of you who don't know, has put into place in their J term a mandatory problem solving course for all of their first year students. And again, the idea is uh, you can get all of these. The, case, the cases are all available on the Harvard website. Uh, it took years. I taught at Harvard about 15 years ago when they were first starting this. So um, they created some very, very complex case studies uh, that transcend, as we heard this morning, a lot of different subject areas. And the students are in working groups like, you know, you're not, wouldn't be surprised to hear from Harvard, like a, like a Harvard Business School case method. 
Um, they, they get the facts and the students have to go out one else, research the law, come up with different plans, and then review them in seminars with professors and teaching assistants. Uh, what we get out of the doing like a lawyer, facts matter. So we have to learn other skills, fact investigation, interviewing, feelings matter. Um, how people feel about their cases matter. Uh, when I teach negotiation for many years at UCLA, I had real people playing the clients with the same set of facts. What was important about that? My students learned that when they interviewed clients about what they wanted, with the same facts, people have different preferences, right? This is a law and economics concept. Different utilities, uh, different things matter to them, and so different clients would make, the same, would make different choices when asked by lawyers, what should I do in this case? teaches the students that problem solving is very fact and context dependent, um, and that when you use can facts too often, and everybody thinks there's a right answer or there's the only way to do it, again, that teaches a very narrow, almost doctrinal form of thinking as opposed to more creative problem solving, which would meet the particular tailored needs of the parties. Um, and uh, again, the question here is, um, I say ultimately for all legal education a balance, uh, some of what I've described is deductive learning and some of it is inductive learning. And in my own view, every legal education needs to be balanced. It needs to have some, uh, some place for students to learn how to deduce things from given principles and other places where they learn how to induce what is a good decision, a good problem solve, a, book, a good solution to a problem based on what they learn while they're working on the problem. Okay, Big Bang number four. For us, that was then Watergate. I just watched the movie Mark Feltz. That was the Deep Throat movie. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who don't know, um, every American law student now is required to take legal ethics. Why? Mm -hmm. 1973, I just finished law school, Watergate. And you may or may not remember, John Dean was testifying. And he came with a little list of names. And the um, congressional committee said, ah, John Dean, you've got this name starred, and that name starred, and that one's not starred. Who's, what's the difference between the stars and the non-stars? Anybody remember? What John Dean said? See, that's how I teach. Nobody gets to just sit there. Yeah. And I just heard the podcast about the, the Nixon affair, but no, I don't think No, no? Does anybody know? <laughs> so yeah. Ehrlichman didn't have a star. Haldeman did not have a star. John Mitchell, who went to my high school, um, right near where Donald Trump grew up at Over Meals, I'll tell you, my husband and I grew up with Donald Trump, so yeah. we'll, we'll tell you stories about that later. Um, <laughs> the stars, John Dean noticed, connoted the lawyers that were involved in the cover-up. And out of that very dramatic testimony, the American Bar Association's response the following year was to put mandatory legal education, uh, legal, yeah. e legal yeah. ethics education into the accreditation standards for all law schools. Now again, empirical question. Do we think that people, just because they take a legal ethics course, are going to be any more ethical than people that don't? I don't think so, to the extent that I've looked at the data and my former colleague Rick Abel has done some great empirical studies of lawyers that have been disciplined. Not so clear there's a relationship between education and behavior, but there still is a belief that we can educate people to behave differently. And so the question I would have now is, when we think about what makes a good lawyer and a good person, um, what besides formally learning the rules of the profession um, would be good educational models for teaching people to be good people? Uh, and again, I would prefer to do that in a problem-solving context, to give people, I do that, to give people ethical dilemmas and then talk to them about what they would do. So online dispute resolution is one place where that's coming up, but lots of other, lots of other places. Um, I'm going to just slip through this. I'm happy to send my slides to any of you who want them. I want to give time to talk. Um, so the next Big Bang, which I've also been a founder of, uh, not originally, um, where's David? William Twining um, it was actually one of the founders of globalization of legal education in a wonderful way. So for those of you who haven't read any William Twining, you should read William Twining. Because um, William, William's argument is globalization occurs at many levels, and it's been very important to me, speaking back to what Orna said about the global and the local. So William Twining um, grew up in Africa and then taught all kinds of other places. And he talks about transnational as being both multinational, um, and that's the Jessup idea of all the gaps between international law and state law, but also extremely local. So think about it. Here we are in a place with many, many um, Muslims. Um, Islam is a transnational phenomenon. It transcends countries. So when I was teaching in the program I'm about to describe to you, my favorite program ever, the Center for Transnational Legal Studies, which is a program I ran in London on behalf of Georgetown and 24 other law schools. Hebrew University was our partner. 
um, and we've been trying to get some of the Israeli, other Israeli law schools to join. We had students um, from 24 different legal systems studying <coughs> trans-systemically, studying multiple systems in the same classroom. It's the best teaching I ever did in my life. Every course was co-taught, or the idea was, they don't always accomplish it, taught by two professors, a common law professor and a civil law professor. And I took a course in Sharia law myself. I audited. The other good thing about this program was the professors could learn from each other. And so I knew you know, this much, now I know that much, but I know what I don't know, and that's the most important thing. <coughs> um, and so the idea was um, to have an engaged classroom with students and professors that were from different systems learning the law um, together. And William Twining came to lecture for us every once in a while, and so did a lot of other um, local, um, and by local I mean both British and European scholars would come and do special lectures on top of all that. And the idea was for the students to learn from each other. And since I'm here, I have to say what my very favorite moment was. The inspiration for me to get involved in this program is some of you know, my parents were um, German um, uh, refugees from World War II into the United States. But I grew up in a very um, New York City <coughs> typical culture, diverse, rich world. On the first week of the first pr uh, program, CTLS opened in 2008. And I was, I did the, uh, we had a um, uh, global practice exercise, which I wrote, which was used for about 10 years, to put the students immediately into a practice exercise. The exercise was an international arbitration problem. And so they were all different students from different countries working together. And many of the students would come over to me and say, I'm really nervous. English is my fourth language. <laughs> and I don't know how I'm going to do against um, the Americans, the Canadians, the Australians, the Singaporeans. Who else did we have uh, that spoke English? And the Israelis who were pretty good at it. Uh, um, and of course, in my little small group, the best student has become my son. I don't have any kids of my own. I adopt my children, my students of my children, was um, a young student from uh, Torino. And English was, in fact, his fourth language. And he did better than anybody else in his group. And it was just wonderful for him to, want, for him to feel the competency to be able to make an argument and to be persuasive in an environment where everybody else uh, was working in their mother tongue or a very good second or third language. But the best moment was when this first week was over and we had a big party for all the students uh, in Regent Park, the German students um, from two German universities and the Israeli students from Hebrew University continued to argue about the case. Everybody else was party, party time, <laughs> beer, wine, let's go have a good time. It's a beautiful summer night in England and London, sun shining, believe it or not. And the Germans and the Israelis were still arguing, and in a positive way, about the case. And they said, Professor Mankelmeta, would you come to a pub with us? And I said, this is the kind of thing, my father is still alive, that just would make my father's heart sing. This program, located in London, enabled students from across different cultures to get together and learn the law together. And I don't know if it's still going on, but a few years after I left, um, uh, El Quds joined um, the program. I don't know, if, do you know if they're still going there? It's very tiny, there are only a few students. But I go there every year to give a talk. And I actually did give a slightly pro-Israeli talk the last time I was there, I forget what my subject was. And afterwards, um, uh, the Al-Quds students and the Hebrew students um, came over also and asked, Professor Mankalou, would you come out and have a, have a beer with us and let's just you know, talk about this. And um, this was, for those of you who have read it, um, Tom, the uh, preface to Thomas Friedman's From Beirut to Jerusalem talks about his hope when he was a graduate student that the dinner table was at Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember which one he went to, but um, someplace at Oxbridge when he was at a um, table with his fellow graduate students and he was studying Arabic um, and Middle Eastern affairs. The notion was that the, the generation of students in a mixed classroom were going to be the peacemakers of the future. And we're not living in that moment at the time, but that's what motivates me. So for me, globalization is about not just each school going out into the world, but as some of you said, having a lot of, as I've had the pleasure to be here, of visiting, professor, visiting professors from elsewhere, but most importantly, to have really authentic um, student conversations. And for that, you need some dispute resolution experts, because there's a lot of tough issues, as you guys face here all the time. Um, so you need, um, you know, in my ideal world, I guess I would say almost every law teacher needs training in dispute resolution. And some schools have hired me to do that, but not as many as I would like. Because managing a classroom where there's a lot of conflict is very important. 
And like Thomas Friedman, I, for me, the future is in the next generation and getting students from all different places to um, be able to talk to each other. Okay, so I'm about to get to the end of this. Um, Big Bang number six has been predicted and all the American deans, we have several of them sitting here, are worried about this. As someone said this morning, who was it who said it? Um, education for what? Um, thank you, David. This is what our deans are totally focused on. Uh, aside from the cost, we can talk about that in our discussion. But um, as, as um, some of you know, Richard Susskind famously said a few years ago, 10 years ago now, I think, computers are going to substitute for lawyers. Um, forms are available, filings are available now with algorithms for deciding things. British Columbia, the state of California, and soon to be the UK are going totally online for certain forms of civil cases. Uh, Orna's studying it, I'm practicing it, I try to have a dispute every time I can if it means that I can go online. Uh, and I've written a little bit, not as much as she has, but I've written a little bit about it. Come back next Monday when I'm going to talk about Me Too here. Uh, the Me Too thing and online. Oh, Sunday. I keep doing that. Next Sunday. <laughs> um, uh, and the question is, um, uh, what are we teaching for if people aren't going to need lawyers anymore? Now, the positive side of all this tech stuff is access to justice. Um, and I believe that it is. I have been converted into believing that it actually will improve access to justice in some places. I've done a lot of work in Australia and some in China in places that are very big with very large rural populations and in India where people actually have access to mobile phones more easily than they do to anything else. Um, I did some consulting for the World Bank about 10 years ago and the revolution in India and Pakistan with the cell phone was just extraordinary, women's issue. Women that had their own micro businesses uh, in uh, fabrics and uh, were, were trying to figure out how to get their products to market and so um, uh, the vice chair of the um, uh, World Bank had me doing some other project and I got to go to a meeting to hear uh, what, how this had revolutionized uh, the work of many women because they were able to communicate about distribution systems uh, by mobile telephone in a way they couldn't do anything before. He said, so nobody's, um, nobody's putting up telephone wires anymore. It's a complete waste. So in many, many poorer and developing nations, this is the future and they were resolving their disputes that way also. So there's a lot of positive uh, stuff happening in tech. And as you all said this morning, what does that mean for us in legal education? Should we be teaching our students to write code? I don't know. That's a whole other language. Um, I was never good at any languages. I read a lot of them. I don't speak any of them, including English, too well. Um, but code, uh, for some, I would say yes. So I think it might be something that would be useful in law school. More important than code would be to study both the ethics and the system design aspects of how to actually construct good um, uh, online dispute resolution. Um, but as I'm going to say next Sunday, you'll hear there are serious problems of actual justice and due process in these systems. What if your little dispute doesn't fit in the template that Amazon gives you to complain about something? Um, I win virtually all my disputes with Amazon and United Airlines because I spend so much money on both sites that I have no doubt there's an algorithm that says give Michael Meadow anything she wants because she's a pain in the neck. Um, so my critique of the end of lawyers is, it's an argument that Richard Susskind has made. I've never found it particularly believable. Uh, I don't think we will get eliminated as human beings embodied in trying to get justice. Uh, but I do think we should think about what Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, said. A good hockey player plays to where the puck is going, not where it's been. So part of what we're talking about in these few days is to imagine the future of legal education um, and the future needs of the profession and then figure out how do we plan for how do we get there. And um, there's, there's some very important aspects to techno lawyering. You heard about big data this morning, uh, da big data mining, e-discovery, all those sorts of things need to be taught. Our civil procedure teachers are teaching e-discovery, not me. I don't teach civil procedure anymore. I did for many years hung up my um, procedure hat. Um, but there are a whole bunch of legal issues for which techno lawyering will never substitute. Big issues that our countries, both of them, face right now. Migration, immigration, <coughs> family law, uh, discrimination, individual personal situations where people don't want just money from Amazon or United Airlines or a better seat. They want some catharsis. They want someone to say, I'm sorry. And a lot of that's going on in the Me Too movement. They want some other form of justice that really continues what lawyers have always done, and that is to bring people together face to face to try to deal with things. Um, 
this is so obvious, there are still plenty of places where we need definitive rulings from courts. We need, we need courts to help um, resolve definitively some of the big divisive issues in our societies, yours and ours, which is very divisive at the moment. So I don't think we're ever going to not need lawyers. Um, <clears throat> what it does mean is that we need to think about what to study in legal education and how to redesign some aspects of legal education. Um, so think about it. We talk a lot about law and science, as you have said, but we don't use scientific methods to study legal education. I'm almost done. To study legal education. Um, and so I've been encouraging my students, certainly a lot of the LLMs that I have from all over the world, to try to design empirical studies to actually study what's working in legal education and what's not. And as, as, as I would say, as a pluralist, not just in process, but in everything, some methods work better for some students and some work better for others. And some methods are better for some subject matters and not for others. Practice isn't uniform, but needs of students are not uniform, so we ought to have um, uh, a lot of pluralism. Um, uh, something that Paul and I was just talking about during the break, <coughs> an interesting question for me is how the substantive law is going to change as a result of all of this technology. What's a contract? What's a, what's a compensable injury in tort? What's property? All of these very basic doctrinal subjects that we all have in our first year themselves are going to change as a result of uh, both simplification of online forms but also the way individuals think about these things. Um, and as I've said often, there aren't only two bodies to a dispute. There's almost always more. Insurance companies, family members, employees, how do we think about that? I won't bore you with all this. These are legal empirical issues. <coughs> how do we actually study legal education? That's what that one's about. Finally, I'm just going to say these are my thoughts to spark our discussion to see what other people think about these issues. Um, as Oren mentioned, <coughs> I love the idea of the university court. It makes me think my brother was a doctor, and when he was in training, I put on a white court coat, and I followed him around to watch how he was teaching his students. To what extent, thank you. <coughs> to what extent do we have anything to learn from medical education that we haven't done? And here are my thoughts. Um, like medical education, a core of only one or two years of the same subject for every law student. There's something about being a doctor, about being a lawyer, about being a dentist, about being an engineer, as my father was. That there's <coughs> some core body of knowledge and ethics and values that everyone who calls themselves that kind of professional should share in common. Next. But then I would add probably a lot more specialization than we have now. <clears throat> so we have certificate programs, we have joint degrees, but I think even your basic law student what to begin to major in something the way we do in our undergraduate studies <coughs> in the United States. To feel practice ready or competent in something, whatever it is, that thing's probably going to change in 10 or 20 years. But for a student to come out and feel not only that they're a lawyer, but they are an intellectual property lawyer, or they're a dispute resolution expert, or they're going to be a real estate lawyer, or they're going to be a discrimination and civil rights lawyer, so that they can really feel like they uh, are a some kind of adjectival lawyer will enhance their sense of professional competence. So I say a little bit more into deep dives, more specialized courses, and courses that do things in different ways. <clears throat> and then, I just, then I'll end right here. I have other slides I'm going to stop. Um, I think the tech challenge to legal education is very important, and I think we need it. And I also want to say not too much, um, because I have it up there on the slide. The best academic paper I ever heard in my whole life, years ago, when I was teaching women's studies at UCLA, was somebody who studied the use of new technologies at every stage of human history. The printing press. What's the first use of printing press, everyone? Bible. That's what you were all taught, the Bible, right? <coughs> no, Not it's a guide true. how to use the printing machine. Pardon? <laughs> it's a guide how to use the printing yeah. machine. <laughs> um, and before the printing press, <laughs> cave paintings, computers. What was the first use? It's up there. Pornography. Oh. Uh, actually, the first cave paintings were pornography. And the printing press, you all, like me, learned that it was the Bible, but not true. Um, actually, there was a lot, much bigger market in, in pornography. So um, this academic paper that I heard many years ago actually traced the use of every single transformation in technology. And I only mention that to you to say that technology can be used for good or ill. 
we have to have it, absolutely, in legal education. We need to think about how it's going to enhance learning, <coughs> and we also need courses in thinking about when is technology potentially problematic and bad. So we can't avoid technology. We are going to have to think about how to teach it. Big data is really important. Big data, data mining is being used to construct a lot of our lives, um, but it also leaves out individual due process, which is probably the single uh, con the single biggest contribution of Anglo-American jurisprudence, that every individual has the right to a fair trial and hearing. Um, and that's something we, as lawyers, have given the world, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of it, but the lawyers will enact that in lots of different ways. So I have a lot more of it to stop. So um, questions, comments, we should have a you know, have a well, first. Um, you know, th this was intended really to get us to talk about some of these ideas or other ideas. So I was yes. very interested in the tension between teaching how marginalized communities, mm -hmm. minorities, are conceptualizing and thinking of law, and you know, mainstream doctrinal like tort law, property law, and so forth. Um, my experience as a dean, I don't know if Polly Oren is experiencing the same, that actually, I mean, you may offer, a, let's say, an elective course about, <coughs> fe a, about feminism, <coughs> but not mainstream feminism. So if you take Israel, for example, <coughs> I'm sorry, so above uh, what we know from Gilligan and McKinnon and Fraser, we have a sort of a body of knowledge about feminism produced by Israeli feminists, like things like Mizrahi feminists, mm -hmm. the Orthodox feminists. So if I would offer an elective course about it, I mean, hire somebody to, to, to teach it as a, a young professor, he or she may do a wonderful job, but the number of enrolled students would be very, very low. And I think this is a reflective of a, of a much intrinsic tension in law faculties, in law schools, how you mitigate between the practical essence of teaching law, and they need to, you know, later on they would like to clear for a Supreme Court justice or a very uh, prestigious law office on the one hand, and now you teach theories in a very rich way, which is not necessarily utility, you know, beneficial from a utilitarian perspective. A couple of answers. <clears throat> Number one, one answer I gave is a Georgetown program. Some course called <coughs> theories, of, theories of Justice is mandatory. So when you see an elective that you think is important and nobody's taking it, or the people who are taking it are the ones that are already interested in it, um, I, I, this is very weird for a very liberal person. I believe in mandatoriness. That's why I said a core curriculum of one to two years that everybody has to take. And a theory uh, or a jur jurisprudence course that would make everybody, everybody, the men and the, all the different schools of feminism have to sit there and listen to feminist theories of law. Um, because as long as these things stay elective, they do tend to reflect um, selection bias and people who want to take them. So that would be one thing. And the second one, would be to, as you just put it, Gotti, to have those theories brought uh, to, to the ground. Ha what difference do they make? So um, I always tell my students to look at the newspaper every day. Now they do it online. I'm still picking up newspapers <coughs> to essentially do um, a, a legal issue spotting exercise with stuff in the news. How would all the different feminist theories, could you give me something to talk about next Sunday in a different way, how would each of the feminist theories deal with the Me Too movement? Um, and we're beginning to see that. And you see, if you look at the French, the French response to me too, that's French feminism. And it is très différent <laughs> than American feminism. And ironically, when I taught women's studies, I actually taught a whole course that juxtaposed French feminist literary theory to Anglo-American literary theory. So, and, and so the first part of the course was reading all the theoreticians. The second part of the course was writing papers of literary criticism using either French theory or American theory to show what the impact would be. Um, and so, for example, we just had a big scandal in Los Angeles break this weekend that the main gynecologist at the University of Southern California uh, has been abusing his gynecological patients for something like 20 years. 
Um, and I was shocked because we have a law in the United States that there has to be a woman nurse or something present in the room. So apparently this was going on even with someone in the room. So that would be a great place to say, what, what kind of feminist theory would explain why this guy, this doctor, could keep doing this with a woman in the room? And the answer would be, you know, the subordination of staff, it's a labor issue, the subordination of um, uh, a nurse who needs her job from the doctor, a fear <coughs> of reprisal, whistleblowing. I mean, uh, I'm going to do this. From this one case, there's a whole bunch of issues. And I think that all students, um, elite students and marginalized, they just learn better when you show them a very concrete example of what's happening in the world and then ask them to go out and try to solve it. I mean, that's a little bit behind the Harvard program, a little bit behind the Stanford program and some of the stuff I do. So um, I would concrete. Another answer I would have is um, I think every first year law student should go out and do a very simple um, empirical project, which is kind of a legal needs survey of their family or something. Say, I'm in law school. And um, you may never have gone to a lawyer in your life. What, what do you think a lawyer might help you with? Um, and so, you know, there, there, there are systematic nationwide legal needs studies, but I think that might be one place to, um, you know, put everybody in a similar footing, actually to expose all the class differences in, in, a, in a class. Because somebody would say, we need a will, or my family needs, you know, a, an estate plan or an investment plan. And somebody else would say, we need a divorce desperately or something like that. So that's some answer to that. Dan. So it, it's, a love, it's, a, it's a very thoughtful, wide-ranging, expansive view, but it seems pretty internal, which is to say there are gatekeepers or out, uh, stakeholders in the bar, in the Supreme Court, and in the ABA that are having a big impact on all of this. So what's the interaction there? Ah, that's your problem, Dino. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I refused to be a dean for yeah. 40 years. <laughs> uh, seriously, I mean, it, it, I, want, I want to respond to that, but I regard myself as a creative educator, and I can't stand all that stuff. So I do as much as I can uh, without having to deal with the regulators. Now, having said that, um, you know, all the ABA tells us these days is that we have to teach legal ethics. Mm -hmm. And now we have to provide experiential, <coughs> in the states of California and New York, it is now in the bar rules that you have to have a certain number of hours. That is changing legal education. Mm -hmm. it, it changes hiring. I know I feel for you, Dean, because you now have to hire people who can teach experientially. It's definitely shifted hiring practices. So there will be a tension between experiential faculty and non, you know, an academic faculty. Um, uh, when I was younger, I participated in a lot of those committees. I was on an ABA committee called Out of the Box with John Sexton, and I quit because uh, we had lots of creative ideas. Yeah. Um, and to the extent the ABA was still accrediting us, the lawyers were in control of it, you know. And you'd think the lawyers would be my friend because I'm saying let's teach to what the lawyers want, but no, most lawyers are there about preserving their own skins um, and not about. So um, it, it's a challenge. I don't have any easy answers other than I believe in schools doing different things because um, it does open up some of that. And, um, you know, and as we talked earlier, the pressure in the United States with the rankings and the money, they're, they're very, that's why I prefer to teach outside of the United States. I will say this, it sounds a terrible, like a terrible thing to say, I'm finding much more creativity outside the United States. Um, the Europeans, like I taught negotiation in Italy two years ago to a very small group and the students just loved it because they were sitting in big didactic classes. And so it got them to figure out they needed to offer more of those classes. Uh, and they're much less regulated. I mean, their students have to pass the bar mm -hmm. and they have low bar pass, you know, they have all those problems. But they're sort of interested in experimentation. And of course, the Europeans, most of them still have the advantage that most education is still state subsidized. Mm -hmm. Most. It's changing. So that um, it's not about you know tuition and paying for all this stuff. Um, and so the only thing I can say, I mean that you know that's a problem, Dean. I, you have you know Dan, it's it's Dan, <laughs> Dean, Dan, it's it's a, a problem for you. Um, is there an Israeli ABA? Is there an equivalent to the ABA? In, yeah, sure. that's this committee you talked about. The Israeli earlier? bar. No, 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 no. no. The Israeli that, bar. The Israeli bar. It's a different thing. The committee is dealing with the finance of the university. The Israeli bar has officially nothing to do with the university. We have our own set of problems. Yeah. <laughs> we are creating different sets of problems. And there is only one bar because Israel is a unitary country, not right. a federal system. Right. So. And David, if you want, he and I at various points can tell you what's going on in the UK, which is a complete mess. The uh, solicitor's exam is going to change. And 
So everyone's got these problems, so you have to create around them. And I would say the only advantage that we have in the United States is 200 law schools. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe in not just <coughs> rankings competition, but, but, but doing different things. It does attract students. It absolutely does. Now, we have the big, biggest problem, and we have a much bigger problem than you do. The bar passage rate in California is the worst in the country. It's really hard. So we have student pressure to teach to the bar. And that's why I said a core bunch of, you know, well, you have to meet their needs as students. We have to teach them what they need to pass the bar. But then that's, you know, it's like this much, and then there's a whole lot of other stuff that they could do. Um, I think we yeah, have time for what, one last what, okay. question, and then we'll... Okay, it's going to be a hard one, Karen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, this morning we heard the, the dilemma posed about whether there should be a, a, a special university or even law school for ultra-Orthodox um, mm -hmm. people that might have issues around gender discrimination in terms of faculty. So, in the United States, we have uh, some law schools that are, that are explicitly devoted to serving the needs of Hispanic uh, law students from first generation families and we have law schools that are in universities that are historically um, African American. Um, is there a place in the world or in the United States for same ethnic group or same racial group uh, focused uh, legal education? Yep, there's a place except not for not, not the orthodox thing is a big problem for me and I'll tell you why. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I know you I think you're more interested, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly tell you my views about this. Um, and these would be very unpopular views here in Israel. Whenever I'm confronted with Orthodox Jews, and my favorite example, I was at a mediation meeting many years ago, and some of you know him, Baruch Bush, who's in our field, you know, wouldn't take my hand when we were all doing it. And I said, my religion is feminism. Why does your religion trump mine? Think about that from the perspective of someone who was brought up in a family, I grew up right next to the UN. Uh, tolerance, appreciation of diversity, um, these are tough questions, um, and I mean that sincerely. My religion is feminism, meaning that someone doesn't not get to touch me because of some religious doctrine of theirs if they're not respectful of my doctrine, which is that we're all equal, and if we're having an exercise in which we touch each other, we touch each other. So there's a conflict in, in, in religions there, like conflict resolution. Think about that one. Um, you know, and, uh, and Baruch and I have had this been going on now for 20 years, and you know, in a sort of friendly but somewhat conflictual basis. Um, having gone to a women's college, and Ruth Ginsburg was our colleague, uh, <coughs> was our colleague and was my friend, when Ruth was um, deciding VMI, VMI is Mil Vir Virginia Military Institute desegregation case, <coughs> um, we had many arguments about this because Ruth is an equality feminist who didn't believe in separate institutions for anybody, race, gender, ethnicity or whatever. And I argued at the time that a certain kind of separate institution was okay as far as I was concerned. I would justify it under American equal, equal protection uh, rules, but ask me, this is the tough part, Anita, she's, she's a very tough Socratic teacher, why, why am I drawing this distinction between um, uh, an, ortho, an ultra-orthodox school that wouldn't allow women teachers, uh, and I have trouble with that, and I would fight against it, um, versus a um, same eth ethnicity, same race um, institution that might be, you know, like the, high, like the black high schools. And in my case, the women's college I went to. I probably wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the fancy women's college I went to because the women ran the whole place and there were, there were models of leadership and all that. And so that's the argument that I buy. And as I used to argue with, with Ruth Ginsburg, um, equal protection constitutional doctrine is, is, is too narrow for me. Um, in the sense of what, you know, I'm looking at outcomes and, as opposed to actual practices. So I think there would be room in the United States. Um, you know, getting past all the formal doctrinal hurdles is very complicated. But from a philosophical perspective, I don't have um, any trouble with that. Um, as long as, you know, there are plenty of institutions in which people could choose whether to go to one or the other. But see, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm going to have time to discuss. Yeah. I'm not persuaded you made the case that right. That, I mean, because of course we already, I'm, my, my point is we already have in the United States it, institutions that serve blacks and mm -hmm. Hispanics, law students, law schools. Um, so why can't there be in Israel a law school that mm -hmm. serves uh, the ultra orthodox faith in, in, on their terms? I just, I, I would love for you to be right, but I just need to hear the case made by all of us and sure. oppose it more forcefully. I'm, I think we don't have a good, I haven't heard a good argument yet. Yeah.
the conclusive argument yet. Oh, no, I have the answer. No, no, I think tomorrow I there's a full session. You yeah, have we'll do the session tomorrow. Yeah. tomorrow no, no, we can, we, I don't want to take from uh, Karin's time. Karin's going to talk, talk She's going to talk on something else, but I know that tomorrow you have a full session. Yeah. So, I would, so we can wait till tomorrow. Right. Be yes. like, well, we'll do it there. Because I don't think that I'm a feminist and yeah. I don't, you didn't shake my hand, it's persuasive. I, I, hear, I hear you. I mean, and I'm not saying it shouldn't be. Yeah. I just would have nothing to do with it. So this is to be continued. Yeah. Okay. Everyone stay with your uh, breath. <laughs> don't ask me to teach in that school. They won't ask me anyway, But I won't come. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carrie, for speaking. So guys, I promised you a talk about Israeli women, so I want to keep up to my promise. So I want to present to you today the backbone of the law of gendered citizenship in Israel. It's already customary to say that men become full members of the collective as warrior citizens through their active participation in the military as the highest form of civic virtue, whereas women become incorporated into the state mainly through the concept of reproductive citizenship. According to the you know, conventional narrative, they say that Israeli women are continually drafted for uh, compulsory maternal service as part of their national mission. And indeed, you know, Israel is famous for its obsession with procreation. We are called a reproductive empire. And we allow and subsidize almost any assisted reproductive technology you can think of. Just to give you a sense, Israel was the first in the world to legalize surrogacy. And our law in this regard is among the most permissive in the world. But today, I would like to challenge this uh, myth of compulsory motherhood or repronormativity, if you'd like, and show you that many bodies of law, and we'll have only time to focus on abortion law and child support law, those laws uniquely problematize our understanding of Jewish pronatalism and of the motherly role as a prerequisite for a <coughs> substantive female citizenship. So, and what we'll try to show you is that feminists are wrong when they say that motherhood is perceived as the be-all and the end-all of Israeli women. It is because while the Jewish state does glorify some Jewish wombs, it also vilifies others. Those others it perceives, you know, as others with a capital O. So let's start with abortion law. First, it will get interesting quickly. This is the only heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, while we would expect Israel as an avowed pronatally state to adopt a prohibitive abortion regime, Israel surprisingly crafted a selective regime that facilitates the termination of those pregnancies that the state deems unworthy. And so if you accept my invitation to conceive of the law as a cultural storyteller, then let's try to decipher together what the statutory conditions teach us about who should reproduce and how. And I suggest that all of this, we will classify into four categories. The chosen mother's clause, the chosen body's clause, the chosen people clause, and the missing clause. Now let's start. So the chosen mother's clause. The state allows legal abortions for women it deems too young or too old to serve as good mothers, to do justice to the mission of producing and raising future normative citizens. Note that the law tellingly does not stipulate a minimum age, but rather resorts to the formula under the marriage age, which tells us volumes about the state desire for a potentially married mother within a traditional family structure. And indeed, the Israeli abortion law grants an immediate license to single women to undergo an abortion. And the, the law also considers, so this one we don't do. So the law also considers the relationship between the mother and the father invalidating abortion. 
And I suggest that this is because irresponsible pregnancies make us doubt on the legitimacy and the Jewishness of the child to be and thus risking contamination of the Jewish demographic. For example, adulterous or incestuous conception would produce socially disabled offspring, children who cannot legally marry in Israel and who can only produce other defective offspring like themselves or also marriage ineligibles. And this preoccupation with the identity of the parents and the legitimacy of the children is a recurring theme that is echoed in other bodies of law. For example, under surrogacy law, the surrogate mother must be both Jewish and unmarried so as to not jeopardize the purity of the child she is carrying. But the law is vicious because, you know, a, a, a single women are only good as womb for rent for heterosexual couples, but <coughs> while they are qualified to serve as incubators, they are not qualified to become mothers via uh, surrogacy. And the law also insists tellingly, right, that all the parties involved must be of the same religious faith, both the surrogate and the intended parents. But the law is tellingly willing to lift this requirement when the parties involved are not Jewish. Mm -hmm. And the same story repeats with adoption law. Mm -hmm. Single women cannot, cannot become adoptive parents, and the law also imposes a strict religious matching requirement, barring Jewish parents from adopting a gentle child and non Jews from adopting a Jewish child. And again, with uh, now the recently enacted ex donation law, the law also uh, imposes a unique donor donor religious matching requirement. So we're beginning to see that and under the selective abortion regime, a woman's role as reproducer involves not quantity, but quality. So now the chosen bodies clause. So the fetal defect clause establishes that a qualified Jewish citizen must be both physically and mentally healthy. Look at baby Einstein over here. And the abortion committees, you know, they are the, the, the implementation mechanism of the law, they take this to the extreme by approving abortions even for mild or unconfirmed uh, uh, defects, including defects that would be simply corrected <laughs> through surgery anywhere else in the world or dismissed as merely aesthetic, such as a cleft lip or a small penis, God forbid. And uh, uh, the Israeli obsession with procreation and with the perfect child has led to a series of world records. Israeli women undergo more pregnancy screenings and resort to abortion for minor defects more often than women in anywhere in the world. We also set records for pre-pregnancy screenings, including genetic tests that are not performed anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, we also take the lead in abandoning uh, uh, disabled newborns um, in the hospital. But to me, what's interesting is the motivation behind all of these world records. And interestingly enough, sociologists found that Israeli Jewish women are powerfully socialized to view the health, normalcy, and appearance of their fetus as part of their maternal responsibility, as part of their national duty to protect society from deformed children. And social scientists could find no other place where a woman's failure to undergo you know, the prenatal screenings and to abort a possibly defective fetus as a betrayal of good and normative motherhood that, that uh, stigmatizes the woman uh, as deviant. So now the chosen people clause. So I will mention only in passing what I call the chosen people clause, uh, uh, which incorporates the Israeli West Side story because it was abolished. But let it be said that if the uh, uh, fetal defect clause regulates genetically unworthy lives, the now repealed socioeconomic clause regulated and monitored the reproduction of ethnic groups socially considered to be inferior. And in a recent article I just wrote, I found that if you look carefully at the legislative history, then it becomes clear that the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, the Knesset fought to increase the, the birth rate of the right demographic, that is Ashkenazi Jews of European and American origins, the white Jews, while monitoring the reproduction of the relatively poor, underprivileged, and culturally inferior um, Sephardic or Oriental Jews of Afro-Asian origins, the, the, the dark Jews. 
So now the missing laws. So far we saw which criteria abortion law includes. But just as interesting are the criteria missing from the list of permissible factors. That's why I call it the mission, the missing clause. So now let's see what's the mission of the missing clause. So Israeli abortion law almost completely ignores the main points of controversy in other divorce regimes, meaning you know, viability, fetal age, the state of pregnancies, however you want to call it. And consequently, late-term abortions are more common in Israel than in the entire <coughs> Western world. And I suggest that this policy derives from the same driving principle underlying you know, the entire abortion scheme that carefully sets down criteria for uh, women and future citizens represent, uh, worthy of representing the nation. And so consequently, the timing of the, of the abortion is relatively inconsequential because it's mainly the nature of both the woman and the pregnancy that the state cares about. So what happens is as follows. When the state is not interested in a woman's reproductive potential, then abortion becomes extremely lenient and the abortion committees approve almost with no exceptions all requests for legal abortions. But at the same time, when the state is interested in a woman's motherhood, then abortion in Israel becomes mission, almost mission impossible, which forces about 50%, according <coughs> to some estimates, 50% of abortion-seeking women to resort to the black market for private abortions, a phenomena that, again, you know, uh, makes the, uh, uh, the um, Israeli ratio of illegal to legal abortions the highest in the Western world. So now I'll move quickly, because I don't have much time. We have a lovely tour coming up ahead to a child support doctrine called the involuntary fatherhood doctrine. You know all those cases that resemble Ripley's Believe It or Not, yeah, an episode of Ripley's Believe It or Not more than legal jurisprudence. And in these cases, men claim to have become fathers against their will, usually by deceitful women who stole their sperm under the pretense of being protected or infertile. And in Israel, until recently, we adopted the philosophy of you play, you pay, or to make it sound more legal, the strict liability theory of the sperm. And you know, this is hardly surprising that the holy land of compulsory motherhood obliges involuntary fathers always to pay child support, which motivates women to become mothers in every circumstance. But in another article I just finished writing, I found that the court recently started recognizing sperm theft as a legitimate defense in a child support suit. And I want to share with you the first case that did so. And like you know, all the cases is in, in this genre, it is quite bizarre. So consider the following facts. A married couple got divorced after failing to conceive. And as part of the divorce, the husband consented to the wife taking a sperm for what would be the last attempt to conceive through IVF. But guess what? <coughs> the woman did not use the sperm in order to fertilize an an her own ova, but in order to fertilize the egg of a non-Jewish donor, which resulted in a baby girl that was born 11 months after the divorce. In the meantime, the father got remarried for the fifth time and had a son. And in a twist of fate, it so happened that both the son and the daughter ended up in the same kindergarten. And at some point, the teacher revealed to the father that his uh, son's uh, uh, girlfriend was his child as well. They ended up in court. And guess what? Not only did the court exempt the wealthy father, he was, it was, he was wealthy, that's why he was able to get married for the fifth time. So the wealthy <laughs> father from child support liability but it also ordered the poor woman to pay a very high compensation in damages. And I ask, why was the quest for motherhood, oh, why was the quest, it will become clear in a minute, why was the quest for motherhood suddenly insufficient for the court? And I suggest that this is because the court wanted to signal to Israeli women that, the, that, that their desire for motherhood may not be endorsed indiscriminately and that being a Jewish mother is about quality, 
no less than it is about quantity. And so the woman is, in this case was penalized because her actions fragmented maternity into its gestational and genetic components and thus profoundly destabilized the determination of maternity in a legal system where eggs and wombs define religious and national identity. And so by taking or using the, um, the egg of a Gentile donor, the woman raised fundamental questions about whether the incorporation of a non-Jewish genetic material into the body of a Jewish woman changes what it means to be a Jew or an Israeli citizen. And so by penalizing the woman, the court most, most assuredly deterred other women from taking such a perverse pathway to single motherhood that uh, uh, jeopardizes the Jewishness of the child. That's why the, like, this is Santa Claus, right? The, the only thing I could think that was the opposite of Jewish. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so what we see is that abortion law and child support law work in tandem to create a hierarchy of Jewish motherhood. When a woman is worthy, then motherhood becomes almost compulsory. But when the woman is suspect, then her motherness becomes otherness and represents a gender to the, uh, a danger, a danger of gender to the quality of the Jewish people. Thank you very much. So now we have a tool coming up ahead. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but you'll get to see me so much, so anyway, we can talk, you know, and discuss, because we have, what time is it? 3.16. See, okay, so we are late. Okay, in Israel, it's okay to be late, but uh, we have, like, we have a lovely tour ahead of us, so we now need to... Uh,